Your Excellencies, Councillors, in the London Borough of New York, distinguished elders, brothers and sisters, comrades and old friends and new friends, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is London. And the United Kingdom, without declaration, without parliamentary approval, but with the support of the so-called Labour, so-called opposition, launched yet another war on another Arab, another Muslim country last night. Without any parliamentary approval, any parliamentary debate, any national debate, any declared support from the people of this country, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer together launched yet another war against yet another Arab country. Many of you know me and one of the distinguished members of the audience, a doctor from Iraq, know me from my work opposing the invasion and occupation of Iraq, which entered my bloodstream. When I hear the word Iraq, I turn as if somebody called my name until now, 20 years later. Who launched the war on Iraq? Tony Blair and the Labour Party launched the war on Iraq. And Keir Starmer and the Labour Party are fully behind last night's attack on Yemen. Somebody asked earlier, what did Yemen do to deserve this? All they said was, until you impose a ceasefire in Gaza and allow the desperately needed emergency aid into Gaza, we will not allow any ships sailing from or sailing to Israel, and we will not allow any shipments of weapons from wherever they have come to a state which is now on trial for genocide. That's why Yemen was attacked last night. No one pretends otherwise. They didn't attack any other ship. They didn't kill one single person. They didn't draw blood. All they said was, if you're coming from or going to Israel, you will not pass through our waters. You can say, it was a kind of economic sanction that they imposed. We like them, don't we? We're sanctioning three quarters of the world. We love economic sanctions. All the Yemenis were saying is not through our waters will you conduct your genocide. The poorest Arab country one of the poorest countries in the world took a step, made a stand better than any Arab country, better than any Muslim country. For truth and word, for truth and deed, no other Arab country took such an action. Yemen should be in our eyes. Yemen should be in our hearts, but our country is bombing them, killing them, to punish them for standing up for Gaza. What shame is this? How ashamed should we be that this was done in our name, at our expense, with our taxes, this crime was committed by our country. You know, my first memory as a, 
and I'm born in all of my life, being of Irish background, how could it be otherwise? As an opponent of empire, of colonialism, of imperialism, my first memory is from Yemen, when British soldiers, Scottish soldiers, were shooting down Arabs in the port of Aden, in the country of Yemen. I remember as if it was yesterday, the skirl of the pipes, the swirl of the kilts, the reports of the guns shooting down people in Aden, in Yemen, fighting for their freedom from British colonialism. And now we're back without ever being consulted, without a vote being cast, without a thought being given to what we could have done with the money that we spent last night on airplanes and rockets and bombs. Could have transformed Europe. Could have transformed it with the money we spent last night in Yemen. I'm boiling with rage at what we did last night. I'm ashamed of my own country for what we did last night, but I'll tell you something that makes me even more angry, makes me even more ashamed. It's that the Labour Party gave it their full support. That's even more difficult. And not one point in the Labour Party has been raised against it. Not one member of Parliament went in today and stood up and raised an emergency, pressed a button, rang a bell, shouted out, got thrown out. Not one voice was raised against it. And so the first thing that I want to say tonight is that these people raised the banner of freedom here in Europe. This new independence is the beginning of a revolt that will spread throughout the whole country. Everywhere I go, everywhere, and people know me, so they speak to me. They say, who can we vote for? We can't vote for Sunak. No. And we can't vote for Starmer. No. Well, this is the kind of thing that needs to happen in other boroughs, in other towns, other cities, up and down this land because people need someone decent and trustworthy to vote for, that they can count on, that isn't there to serve the interests of others. Let me digress for a minute. I spoke about the money we spent last night in Yemen. Rishi Sunak is in the Ukraine today and handed over another 2.5 billion pounds of our money to the crooks in Kiev. What could we have done with 2.5 billion? How could we have improved our streets, our houses, our health service, which is coming apart at the seams? My daughter is here. Her mother was in the hospital in the a and &E in South London for a cut head for 14 hours or 16 hours before she was seen. So overwhelmed were the people in the AME in Lewisham. We could have fixed that with the money we gave to Ukraine yesterday, yeah. to the money we spent attacking Yemen last night. Of course it's mainly about blood, but it's also about treasure. Who agreed to give our treasure away in wars, in bombs, in missiles, and in gratis handouts to the crooks in Kiev? Nobody's making these points in national politics. No. I'm not here to electioneer. But if I get into City Hall, there'll be some changes, I can tell you. There'll be some real changes, I can tell you. And what I want, 
How shameful that our meeting was cancelled. In an Afro Caribbean center. On the day that South Africa was putting Israel on trial, the Afro Caribbean center cancelled our meeting for Gaza. I have no doubt that they were bullied. Bright maybe, maybe bright then bullied to cancel our meeting. And who do you think was behind it? The mayor! Labour must have been behind it because Labour are walking in fear of this banner behind me because they know that the people in Europe had enough of them. I met some old friends tonight from the Queen's Market campaign. He said, will you support us? I said, I've been supporting you for 10 years. It's still going on. 10 years. In fact, they've been going for 20 years. I've been supporting it for 10 years. What kind of a power do we have here? I thought when you got rid of that little Scotsman. <laughs> Disgrace in Scotland. <laughs> I thought things had changed here. I saw we had a woman. I saw we had a Muslim woman. I thought, well, things will turn the corner now in Europe. They've actually got worse <laughs> rather than better here in the world. Can we actually make sure that the days when labor could count on all of you to vote for any donkey that they put up as long as they had the right color of rosette. If you vote for donkeys, don't expect anything but ah, that's what donkeys do. Don't expect any difference. And now you have an alternative to vote for. Yesterday, South Africa made us all proud. Especially those of us who had the honor to serve as activists in the army of Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress and their armed struggle on Conti and says with the spear of the nation, I had the honor to do all of those things. I'm connected by blood to South Africa. My own blood spilled on the ground of the Google police station in Cape Town, South Africa. Spilled as a result of repeated blows to the face by an apartheid police officer who beat me in the cells in that police station of Google Eto, one of the great townships of the African people in South Africa. I gave some of the best years of my life underground, traveling the length and breadth of South Africa, fighting for the day that we saw yesterday when a free South Africa could be my the criminal of the world. The criminal when we, those of us of a certain age, were fighting for freedom in South Africa, Israel was in bed with the apartheid regime in South Africa, giving them weapons, helping them get a nuclear bomb, which they almost succeeded in doing, helping to break the growing international sanctions, which isolated the apartheid regime had helped to bring it down between the hammer of the South African people's resistance and the anvil of international solidarity. And we have to play our part in being that anvil for Palestine. The Palestinian people will resist. Be sure of that. For more than 50 years, I have been with them side by side. 
They will never surrender. Never. They will fight and their faith. Isn't this one of the most striking things? When their families have been killed, when their houses have been destroyed, when they have nothing to eat or drink, they're still thanking God. Their faith is completely unlimited. Well, I mean, they are the most faithful Muslim people anywhere on the earth. The people of Palestine, the people of Gaza. And so they should be, because at the heart of this is Jerusalem. This Zionist gang, led by Netanyahu, will not stop until they have destroyed al Aqsa itself. They will not stop until they have driven the Muslims and the Palestinian people from the old city of Jerusalem, from what they call the Temple Mount. And they are the town. Be sure of this. Remember you have them here. They are the town to destroy our accent. And by the way, on the way up the slope in the old city, entering from the Damascus Gate, you have to walk past the church of the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was laid, where his blood is there. And the Zionist settler gang spit at its door. They literally spit on the people coming out of the church. It's one of the great mysteries of this period. So all these Christian people, some of them wearing Jesus on their sleeve, telling us endlessly how religious they are, how Christian they are, don't give a damn about the Palestinian Christians whose churches are being bombed and defiled and whose faithful people, congregations are being killed and persecuted by these armed Settler gangs. In Gaza, Israel destroyed the second oldest Christian church in the entire world. And no cleric said one word about it. This so-called Archbishop of Canterbury couldn't raise his voice, never mind his hand, against the destruction of that church or against the mother of the two ladies sitting inside the church of the Holy Family in Gaza who were murdered by a sniper and none of these Christian leaders so called could even find words, never mind actions to condemn it only the Pope and even that half-heartedly has said anything meaningful to try and bring this carnage to an end. All these American politicians who are always telling you what great believers they are don't give a damn about the plight of Christians being bombed in the Holy Land. Thanks to him. Where Jesus was born was closed at Christmas because it's in a state of siege. It's people unable to move in or out of the town to exercise their religious freedoms. But of course, by far the highest price, as South Africa made devastatingly clear, I mean, if there's any justice, how could South Africa's case fail? If these judges are worthy of their wigs, how could they possibly find otherwise than that Israel is embarked upon an openly genocidal campaign? <coughs> Actually, Israel condemned itself from their own mouths. Part of South Africa's case was just showing the videos of what the Israeli leaders said and what their soldiers subsequently did. If that's not genocide, what is? 
What could possibly be genocide? If from the president and the prime minister of Durham, you are openly stating that you intend to drive a whole group of people only because of who and what they are off their land and into somebody else's land, how could that not be genocide? That's the very definition of genocide. Literally, it is the definition of it. I don't know if these judges will find in South Africa's favor. But I know that already the people of the world have found Israel guilty. Guilty of genocide. And that changes everything. Whether the judges find for South Africa or against it, it changes everything. For everybody, except the British Labour Party, <laughs> the European, who had four MPs sitting with President Herzog on the day that South Africa were on their feet making their case in front of the ICJ in The Hague. And they were there deliberately. The timing of their visit was deliberate. Their photo opportunity with Herzog, the President of Israel, was deliberate. It was sending a message. We stand with you. Well, your message has to be, if you stand with them, we will never again stand with you. We will never again give our support to you if that's the company that you prefer to keep. I know the Palestinian people well. For more than 50 years, I have been in this struggle. I know Gaza, every inch of it. And long before Hamas even existed, But there's one experience that I say, not just that I'll never forget, but that I will take to the judgment day. It was in 2014, when I led one of my several convoys of aid, hundreds of vehicles, to break the siege on Gaza. I met a little girl who had lost all of her family, her mother, her father, her brothers, her sisters. Just a little girl. And she said to me the following words, which I would take with me to the last day. She said, where is this Ummah that they tell us about in school? Where is this Arab world that they tell us about in school? Why did they leave us alone? Why have they left me alone, standing with no family and no house? I turned away because my eyes were filled with tears. Yes, but because I had no answer. How do you answer that question? So although we have work to do here in Europe, although we have work to do here in Britain, the Muslim world has to ask itself deep, deep questions in the wake of what we have seen over the last hundred days, and in fact over most of the last hundred years. How is it possible? I was very close to President Arafat. Once I went with him to China, he asked me, do you want to come with me to China? Oh, yes. <laughs> we flew all the way to China, we had a meeting in the airport, got back on the plane, and flew back to Tunisia. I didn't see outside the airport in China. But the Chinese leaders that we met said to Arafat, the Arabs are not serious about liberating Palestine. If they were serious, they could all walk into it. There's hundreds of millions of them. At that time, there was five million 
Israelis. Now there's seven million Israelis. Arabs could all walk into Palestine and take it back. Arafat had no answer for that. As you can imagine, it wasn't his fault. But it's true. How is it that an Arab world of 350 million people, a Muslim world of 2.5 billion people, cannot deliver a crust of bread to a starving child in Gaza? How is that possible? How is it possible that out of 2.5 billion people, we can sail a ship into the harbor at Gaza and say, sink me if you will, but this ship is filled with desperately needed food and medicine for people who are dying now of famine as well as bombardment. How is that possible? And the answer is uncomfortable. That the Muslim world is ruled by the same kind of people that are ruling you. That are ruling your world. That are ruling the United Kingdom. People who care nothing about the people they are supposed to represent and care everything about their positions, their chairs, the jobs they're going to be given afterwards, the money that they have. I saw a video the other day of a man taking the grave of his own wife in Gaza. He was standing in the grave. And he addressed a man with a camera who came to see what he was doing. He said to him, all you are rulers, however rich you are, however great you are, you are going to end here in this kind of grave, in this earth. And you will have nothing, nothing that you value, nothing that you filled your pockets with. You will have none of your limousines, your gold. You will be like my wife in the earth of this grave. And then in the darkness of that grave. And then will come the judgment day on which everything you did and everything you didn't do will be judged by the Almighty. Which direction, he said, do these rulers think they'll be going on that day? Up or down? I'm certain that most of them will be going down because no God could possibly forgive the crimes of which we are speaking here today. But we don't live in the Muslim world. We live in the Western world. We live in a Western world that it's never done telling us how free it is. You're free to do anything. You can cycle naked through London with none of that behind the bear. You're free to do it in public like an animal in the field. You're free to curse prophets. You're free to do any of the things that the more base of our instincts are lead us to. But the one thing you're not free to do is have a meeting in the Afro-Caribbean Center of our <laughs> You're not free to do a little on social media and you're not free to appear on the so-called mainstream media because we'll just never invite you. <laughs> You're not free to choose other than Tweedle D or Tweedle Dum, one cheek or the other cheek of the same backside, because if you vote for Jeremy Corbyn, we'll destroy him and we'll destroy all his friends. We'll expel them. 
will slander them, will disgrace them, will tell them and feather them with the false accusations of anti Semitism and racism. You're not free to elect Germany permanent. You're not free to go and defend the Palestinians in Gaza. Try it. But you are free to go and fight with the Israel occupation force and come back and resume your job as a policeman or a bank manager with the blood of children in Gaza on your hands. You're free to do that. And Ukraine. But, but if you were to go, yes, and Ukraine. But if you were to go and somehow get yourself into Gaza, they'd tear up your passport. They would deny your nationality. And if you made it back here, they'd throw you in prison. So you're not free. It's an illusion. You're only free to do the things that they're quite happy for you to do. After all, if you're bicycling naked through London, you're not trying to get rid of the Prime Minister. You're not trying to change the London Bar of Europe. All you're doing is titillating yourself. You're not free. I've made many films. The killings of Tony Blair. Killing Kelly, David Kelly. You ever see them on television? You're not free to have your work heard. I'm not allowed to work in Britain because I worked for RT, which many people miss, including me. <laughs> You're not free to challenge fundamentally the things that are wrong in this country. And freedom and democracy turns out to be an illusion. My father, God rest him, went to his grave believing the BBC was the finest broadcasting corporation in the world. <coughs> Yesterday, it didn't televise one minute of South Africa's case. Today, it televised all of Israel's defense. How do you even explain that? How do you explain to an audience we're going to show you the rebuttal of a case that we didn't show you. How does that even make sense as a matter of simple logic? Democracy, freedom, freedom of speech all turned out to be hollow because where it matters, we are no longer free. And that's what we have to change. And we have to do it in many ways. And I've seen, I saw Councillor Sophia, I saw her picking up trash in the streets. I saw you picking up trash in the streets. Because the council won't do it. They've got money for lots of things, but not for keeping the streets clean. We have to be active. Show the people that you are them and they are you. You're not some prince or princess that won an election and then spends the rest of your life eating buns. Most of them are twice the men they were when they went in, if you get my drift. <laughs> you have to be with the people, with the masses. The masses are looking for leadership and the new independence party is providing that leadership. Please don't leave here tonight without signing up. Either joining the party, my wife and I are looking at apartments in New York now. I hope if we get one, you'll let me join the New York Independent Party. And if possible, join them. Join this great campaign. 2024 is going to be a year of elections.
going to be the mother of all the years for elections. We have the chance to get rid of Starbuck. We have the chance to get rid of Sunnah. We have the chance to get rid of Sadiq Khan. And we have the chance to change more for the better. And for the better.